Yo guys, what is up? Here we are with another reading video. And today, we are going to finish the Boise Challenge Hitler with chapters 18 and the epilogue. So I finally got a new mic so I can start recording again. And I think that this is a much better mic than my other one. So that's good news. So, we are just gonna get right into it with chapter 18 our evening with mr churchill after liberation came the task of transitioning denmark from an occupied nation to a free country some german soldiers refused to surrender danish nazis despised by their countrymen and with nowhere to go had no choice but to fight to the bitter end in the weeks after liberation thousands of german soldiers just hung around denmark sometimes still running things reluctant to to return to a Germany that remained at war in many parts of the globe and whose cities, pounded by Allied bombers, had been reduced to smoldering ruins. In the end, most Germans marched out of Denmark, laying down their weapons at the border. In the weeks following liberation, 15,000 accused collaborators were arrested and tried in Danish courts. Of these, 13,521 were found guilty and 46 were executed. The organized resistance helped manage the swing back to a Danish-run government. As a company group leader, Nud Peterson was ordered to take his men to a building at Alborg Civilian Airport to oversee the transition from German to Danish management. He expected the change to be well underway, but when he and his men arrived, they were shocked to find that the airport was still run by Germans. Danish citizens were still flashing identity cards to German masters just as, though, just as they had throughout occupation. None of his men ra moved rapidly to take over. I gave the order to confiscate confiscate all identification cards and give German employed and give the Germans employed their two hours to get their belongings and depart. The German commander came out boiling mad and I told him to leave at once. Within minutes a crowd of motor traffic was closing in on us from all over the airport. English jeeps with British Tommy soldiers and Danish resistance cars spilling over with officers. My chief cancelled my orders at the airport base in order that everyone's ID cards be given back. I was ordered into into a car and driven to our headquarters where I was lectured. I I had exceeded my authority, my chief said. I had strayed outside of command. You obey or you will obey orders from this moment on, he said. I refused. How could I obey? The scene at the airport was first hand evidence that the elements of the resistance had been corrupted. Now our forces were coming in that Danish authorities had already freed German sympathizers from some prisons. Was that what we had fought for? I found other group leaders who were just as frustrated as I was. Together we wrote out a list of five demands to govern the, trans the gen transition. Number one, all Germans should be put behind bars. Two, J Danes should, start, should, should stop trading with Germans. Collaborators should be arrested at once. Four, that was three. Four, food for German soldiers should be rationed. Five, resistance should be cleaned of corruption. I took the five points to a printer who prompt promptly left the room and called the police. My chief company found me, relieved me of my command, and confiscated my weapons and ammunition. Now I was on the street again, with no command and no future in the resistance. I glumly returned to the monastery and mulled my options. None looked good. I was still a dark cloud a few afternoons later when, to my surprise, a car from Com K Company came screeching up to the monastery. The same men who dismissed me days before now hailed me warmly and returned my sh machine gun ammunition and signs of grade. What could have happened? It turned out that Major General Richard Dewing, the British commander of all military forces in Denmark, had come to my rescue. Not that he meant to. Now that liberation had come, he wanted to meet the legendary Churchill Club, Denmark's first resistors. He would soon be visiting Alborg. He ordered his staff to round up as many clubbers as they could find and have them at the Hotel Phoenix at a certain time. We were astonished by the meeting. Oof Darkett told us that a British Royal Air Force plane had shown up at his post in Germany with a pilot whose orders were to take him to Alborg, Denmark. There was no explanation, just let's go. Hellage, Oof, the Professor, Alf, all of us. Everyone had a similar story. Uh, and below there is a picture of Je with the caption, General doing meeting with the Churchill Club. Um, the General is at the head of the table and not as to his immediate right. Okay. On the day of the meeting, we were seated at a long table in the hotel dining room with General Dewing at the head. He greeted us individually by name. He said he wanted to know. He said he wanted to know our whole story, from Odin's to Alborg to Nyborg State Prison and beyond. So we detailed our lives first as angry schoolboys, 
that is increasingly bold saboteurs, and that is prison inmates. We gave him the late night. We gave him the late night raid on the Fuchs Construction Company's headquarters at the airport. Remembered how good it felt to use the framed photo of Hitler as a trampoline. We told stories of stolen weapons and ruined autos and scorched railway cars. He laughed out loud when we came to the when we came to the dummy bar on the cell window at King Hans Gade's jail. He asked question after question. Finally, he pushed his seat back and stood. This is a good story, he said, saluting us. I'll tell it to Mr. Churchill. Winston Churchill did indeed hear the story, but probably not from general doing. Five years later, in the autumn of 1950, Denmark was no longer preoccupied with the war. For the first, for the first two or three years of deliberation, the air had been thick with accusations and demand for, for justice to the traitorous cl- collaborators. But now there was a sense in the population of getting on with things, that the horrible war was at last behind them, that the sun was shining again. The Churchill Club had scattered, and there was had never been a reunion. Most of its members were launching careers and starting families. Not Peterson. I had moved to Copenhagen. At the time, I was taking a few classes at law school, but my real love, as always, was art. I spent all the time I could painting and talking late into the night, debating and learning about new trends in modern art. Like all young students of Copenhagen at the time, and especially our students, I barely had enough money to buy a cup of coffee. To get by, I got up each morning at five to deliver newspapers. I also worked in a brewery, sorting empty bottles. It was about as challenging as the work I had done at Nyborg State Prison. Wait, I think, oh, there we are. Okay, I skipped a page. One night, I got out of class and was hurrying across the city square to meet some friends when I glanced up at the electronic headline wrapped around the top of a newspaper building. It read, Churchill Club to meet Winston, to meet Winston Churchill. I stopped. Pedestrians rushed past me if I was some stone in a stream. I stumbled to a telephone box in Nola Square, but I couldn't scrape up the coins to call home. Just then, my glance went to a white banner stretched across in front of the hotel next to the newspaper building. Churchill Club meeting headquarters. I gave my name to the lady at the rever- reservation desk and asked for a telephone. She said they had been trying to find me all day. Old club mates trickled in through the night and the next morning. Unfortunately, Jens was working as an engineer in India and could not attend. Some were university students and I still and still knew each other, but I had lost touch with my, lost touch with nearly everyone. Several were fathers now. I hope that was in my future. Sir Winston Churchill's main business in Copenhagen was to accept an award for outstanding contribution to U- European culture. The award ceremony would be held the following night at Copenhagen's 3,000 seat KB Hall. The Churchill Club members were still puzzled as to exactly how all this had come about, but they went along with the attention, with the attention and the opportunity to meet Churchill. The event sponsor was a newspaper whose reporters and photographers had endless ideas for publicizing the event, including giving them all big Winston Churchill cigars to smoke while the camera shutter snapped. The following day, while Winston Churchill and his family launched lunched with the Danish king at the castle. The Churchill Club club enjoyed a luncheon in their honor at the he- at the hotel. Master of Ceremonies was a monk, a resistance hero who had been the contact between this secret British saboteur, sabotage organization, SOE, and the Danish military in- intelligence. When he spoke, the Churchill Club members finally found out who- how they had come to be honored. Ned Peterson. M. Monk said he had sat next to Churchill on the fight flight across crossing the North Sea from London to Copenhagen just a couple of days before. That gave him the chance to tell Churchill how and why the club was formed, about the work we did, and why we named ourselves after him. Monk told us that Ch- Churchill was moved and felt strongly that our contribution had to be acknowledged. The moment was now. Who knew when he would, would be back in Denmark? Round up as many of them as possible, Mr. Churchill. Mr. Churchill had told M. Monk, and that was how we came to be gathered hastily. Here at this hotel in Copenhagen, although Churchill could not focus on the Ch- Churchill Club in his, in his acceptance speech, he wished to greet us in an honor parade just bef- before his remarks, acknowledging us as as much as a general passes by troops on tour of an inspection. The big moment came. I confess that I was absent. I missed the parade. I got separated from the group, and by mistake, I went to the wrong door to the hall in the VIP entrance where Churchill and his wife. And the officials entered. I was only two meters from Churchill when we walked in. Our eyes met for a moment. It felt like he was looking into the delvish eyes of a confident. Eyes that almost weakly said, Don't believe all you hear about me. 
An attendant at, at his side bowed to me slightly and said, Your card, sir. I withdrew my invitation from my pocket and showed him. I hadn't read it and didn't know what it said, but whatever it was, it was magic. He returned the card and led me to a special VIP box. To my left was Prince Nud, representing the royal family. To my right was Admiral Erhard J.C. Quistard, chief of all Danish military forces on land and sea in the, and in the air. When lights went down for Churchill's acceptance speech, I slipped the card from my pocket and drew it close to see what it said that could have possibly landed me in a high rent district card. It was a simple business card. Below my name was below my name was my title. It was the same title that had landed me landed me in two Danish prisons. It had inspired robotic guards to try to reduce me to a number. My title had been cursed and lauded in thousands of living rooms and kitchens and workplace during Denmark's bleakest hours. It was a title I'd taken on as a boy and would wear with the rest of my would, would wear with pride for the rest of my life. The card read Nud Peterson, member of the Churchill Club. Epilogue Times that the times that followed. In the years after the liberation of Denmark, the experiences of imprisonment, war, and sabotage work left many of those in the Churchill Club and the RAF Club scarred for life in various ways. Here's what happened to some of them. Uh Churchill Club's Cathedral School students and younger members. Nud Peterson worked briefly after the war as a newspaper reporter, attended law school, and worked for a film company before devoting his life to art. In 1957, Nud founded the world's first lending art, art lending library in Copenhagen, St. Nicholas, Copenhagen's St. Nicholas Church, making art available to all people, rich or poor, by lending out original artwork for periods of three weeks. The fee for a loan was, at the beginning, the price of a pack of cigarettes. Nudd said proudly during an interview in 2012, the art library still exists as an important resource in Copenhagen. Nudd's own artwork is represented in New York's Museum of Modern Art and in the Tate Modern in London, among many other collections. His work with the Fluxus Art Movement is collected in Denmark's State Museum of Art. Nudd and his wife, Bodie Ritzker, founded the European Film College in Denmark which has become an international success in the film world. A personal note by Philip Hoos. Nudd was in his late 80s when we worked on this book. He was in fine health to begin with, but there was always a sense that we'd better move fast, for we did not know how much time he had. We wrote email messages back and forth nearly every day, even on weekends, me forwarding drafts from my office in Maine, Nudd responding from his art library in Copenhagen. Just weeks before Christmas 2013, a week went by with no word, from Nudd. This was unprecedented and ominous. I wrote again and again with no response. Finally, on January 3rd, 2014, he tapped out a message from a hospital bed. Pneumonia had nearly taken his life. He said that he had actually felt the presence of death in his room. I had the feeling that a shadow was walking softly around me, he wrote, looking for a good place to get through for a final hit. I told it to wait, because you and I were not done yet with our work. I think our work kept me alive. Now I am fit to fight on. So we fought on, finishing the book in the late autumn of 2014. Nud was delighted. The first thing I did after I read it, he said, was to forward it to my gr children and grandchildren. And then, in early December 2014, Nud again fell silent for more than a week. On December 12th, he reported from his bed, I am losing weight dramatically and have no appetite and energy. After a series of tests, puzzled doctors prepared Nud for a full body scan. The prospect of entering a narrow tube terrified him. Imprisonment at Nyborg had left him claustrophobic, afraid of, afraid of being confined. Throughout his life, he had refused to take an airplane or even a ride in an ele elevator. Doctors said that I am fragile, Nudd observed in one of the last notes I received from him. But how fragile can one be who in 89 years has lived in the most cruel century anybody could dream of? I will keep you updated. <coughs> Excuse me. Nud Peterson, Churchill Club leader, Danish resistance hero, and one of the most important young people in all of World War II, passed away shortly after midnight on December 18, 2014. He was treated as a national hero, buried in, in Copenhagen's Assistance Cemetery, along with other Danish figures, such as Hans Christians Ander Andersen and Soren Kurgen. Nud is survived by his wife and their three children, Claus, Christine, and Rasmus. Jens Peterson was a brilliant student who gave up his resistance work to study engineering following his release from Nyborg State Prison. After graduation, Jens was hired as a construction engineer by a British foreman set to India to oversee the building of several bridges. But he became unhappy in India and returned to Denmark, where he lectured at the college he had attended. His health began to decline and he struggled with depression. Lung cancer claimed him in 1988. He died in a hospital after a very unhappy life, said his brother Nudd. 
His death was the result of highly intelligence combined with the low tolerance for jails and or maybe wars. Jens had two sons, Gorman Lars and a daughter, Karen. Idril Astrup Fredrickson, who changed his last name to Foxburg after the war, was in a German-run hospital in Alborg recovering from his broken leg on Liberation Day. Once freed, he returned to his studies but had trouble concentrating. Like some of the other Churchill clubbers, he had had what he called prison scars. Violent nightmares afflicted him. Dreams filled with Gestapo agents. He became depressed, absent-minded, and restless. His, sh- his short-term memory suffered. After two years of treatment with the counselor who had other resistors as patients, he regained his health. He became a civil engineer and was able to work steadily, although his symptoms flared up once in- uh, up again and again throughout his life. Egil died in 2012. Borg Ollendorf was arrested with the other Churchill Club members in May of 1942, but he was too young to be jailed. Authorities deported Borsch to a young insti- youth institution in a small town far away from Alborg. His attention was quickly drawn to a heavily traveled bridge between Jill and Hidfunen. Borsch made clip- quick plans to blow it up, but authorities caught wind of his plan when they observed his daily visits to the bridge. He was still too young for jail, so authorities moved him again. He became the leader of a small religious movement after the war and fathered 12 children. Wow. Modrins Fajelera, the professor, studied economics at University and worked for the Council of Aarhus, Denmark's second largest city. He married and became the father of a son and a daughter. His daughter, Eva Fischella, came became a world-class fencer who participated in the 1996 Summer Olympics. Bodrich Fajella died in 1991. Helge Milo became an engineer first employed in Norway and later at the Lindo shipyard in Denmark. In 1971, he started his own engineering firm, working working mostly with the shipping industry. He had a son, who was 58 at, it, at this writing, and a daughter, 23. And this was written in... was written in 2000... I'm guessing it was 2014. This is text copyright 2015, but it was first finished in 2014. Because I said that earlier. Um, Helge Milo became an engineer, first employed in Norway, and late... No, I would read that. My bad. Uf Darkett, whose boyhood passion was building model airplanes, worked as a pilot and eventually became a pilot, a flight captain on transcontinental Scandinavian airline flights. He retired at age 60 and died in 2013. Mojitz Thompson became a manager of one of Denmark's biggest banks. He specialized in arbitrage, the, practi- the practice of buying something, such as foreign money or gold, in one place and selling it almost immediately in another place where it was worth more. The Churchill Club's Barndalus III older members. Alf Horberg, Kaj Holberg, and Nut Hornbo were the only members of the Churchill Club still in prison at the time of liberation. Having been court-martialed by German Germany for removing the dummy cell bar and committing sabotage in Alborg, they were imprisoned in Germany. After much politi- political wrangling between Germany and Denmark, the Holbergs returned to Horsens State Prison in Denmark and placed, and placed in a special unit for political prisoners. In all, there were 15 political prisoners isolated in the prison wing. Just before 19, Christmas of 1944, a prison pastor offered help offered to help Alf and the others escape. He gave Alf a secret plan. It would be risky, but it was a path to freedom. Alf gathered his fellow prisoners and explained the opportunity. Alf made it clear he was all for it. Every day they stood the risk of being moved to a German prison, and Alf had seen enough of German prisons. But communist prison, prisoners, comprising of half of the group, distrusted the plan. The 14 inmates voted and split evenly, 7-7. Seven to seven. The group rehashed, rehashed it from every angle but remained deadlocked. Finally, a 15th prisoner who had been away from his cell during the discussion returned. Alf put it before him, the deciding vote. He was an old man, he told him. That wasn't how he wanted to die. He voted no. Alf dutifully reported the result to the pastor, who was deeply frustrated, as were the other yes voters. They told the pastor they were willing to act on their own. Alf revealed that he'd prepared to escape for some time. He'd already carved a wooden pistol, which, coated with black paint, looked perfectly real. The day before New Year's Eve 1944, the prison pastor delivered an authentic pistol to Alf and revealed the plan. At 2.44 p.m., he said, You all will be in the yard on your afternoon walk. When you hear the sound of a ladder being placed against the yard wall, run toward it. That will be your only signal. It will be up to you to find the ladder, which will be lowered from the other side. Climb over the wall, and colleagues will be waiting to drive you away. Godspeed. The 
They were all let out for the walk at 2.30. Outside the wall, a truck rolled up at 2.44. Two men clanged a ladder over the wall. Alf pulled his pistol on two of the three guards and backed towards the ladder. A choke cold from another prisoner, a former boxer, took care of a third guard just before he could reach the alarm. Seven prisoners went up over the wall and went, then went down to freedom on the other side. The whole escape took only three and a half minutes. The escapees were, were sent by resistance leaders to different places in Jutland. Alf was given a resistance contact in Randers and reported there. He functioned as a courier between the escapees and their contact point. Most of them wanted to go to Sweden. Alf wanted to stay in the country. Why well, worked for Denmark's freedom, he reasoned, only to go to Sweden. He became second in command for the resistance in Randers and took part in sinking two German ships. After the war, Alf became a manufacturer of plastic laminated sheets for ID cards. A series of heart attacks paralyzed him. When daily activities became too difficult and he feared he could not survive another seizure, he drove his wheelchair to the Museum of Danish Resistance in Copenhagen and donated his car pistol to the Churchill Club collection. Then he went home and took his life. Cash Olberg, the oldest Churchill clubber, died as a young man. Ned Horbo Hornbow emigrated to the United States and became an American citizen. The RAF Club Nud Hedelin, Little Nud from Odense, was arrested for sabotage and set, spent six months in Odense jail. After the war, he enlisted in the British Army and spent se several years in India. He died there at an early age. Harold Hol Holm joined the British Army after the war and was stationed in West Germany. His behavior became erratic. To ensure that the peace would be permanent, he began to destroy stockpiles of British ammunition. The behavior earned him a bed in a ma mental hospital, and he was sharing a room with a Nazi collaborator when Nod Peterson found out and got them separated. Hans Jorgen Andersen died in his German prison cell. He was confined in an overcrowded, de disease-ridden camp where prisoners were simply worked to death. Hans Jorgen's death certificate identified him as an artist and said he died of tuberculosis. Orla Mortensen likewise died as a like, likewise died a German prisoner. Little is known about his exact cause of death. It occurred while he and other prisoners were cleaning up or cleaning up at a railway plant in a small German city after an Allied bomb attack. Once captured, most most other RAF club members were sent by the authorities to western to Western prison in Copenhagen and placed in a special section reserved for political prisoners and resistance fighters. Probably they were deported to Froslov, a camp near the German Danish border, a stop to final transport to Germany. Peterson and family and friends. Edvard and Marth Peterson, Judd Nunn and Jen's parents, moved from Albor to Copenhagen when the Reverend Peterson retired from the ministry. He died at 74. Margaret lived to age 94. Gertrude Peterson, Nunn and Jen's sister, moved to South Africa where she worked as a Danish consulate. After her husband died, she moved to Bath, England, to be close friends with, be close to her friend Patrick Bibby. Gertrude died at seventy. And that is, oh no, it's not one more page. Patrick Bibby remains to this day a friend to the Petersons, and later married John Moore Heath, an Englishman who became British, who became British ambassador to Chile. She lives in England and Mexico, and Mexico with her children. Pat and I are still lifelong friends," said Nudge shortly before his death. Greth Warbeck. Nudd's prison fantasy love went to college and received an education as a technical designer. Albor Cathedral School is still educating students. It is the oldest college prep school in North Jutland. His historical documents dated its founding as far back as 1540. In those days, the school was housed in the wing of a monastery that became the headquarters of the Churchill Club. Albor Cathedral School had been rebuilt and expanded several times most notably when it first admitted girls in 1903. There are about 80 teachers and 700 students at the school today. And that is the end of the book. I hope you guys did enjoy this video. If you did, make sure to share the video, uh, like the video, and don't forget to hit the subscribe button. I'll see you guys in the next video.